Bismillah. اللهم صل وسلم وزد على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. As announced after Juma and on social media, the topic of this lecture is the life of Abu Hanifa, an Imam Al Azam, رضي الله عنه. And uh, this will be the first of uh, a series of sessions, inshallah, as we come every last or every fourth Friday of the month between now and Ramadan. I think we have four Fridays. So we're in February, March, April, May. Yeah. So we should be able to finish the four Imams, inshallah, by the time Ramadan comes. You, some of you may have noticed that when I said Imam Abu Hanifa, I said radiallahu an. One time I was yelled at for that. So I'll tell you about that. <laughs> it was Ramadan, mashallah. It was Fajr prayer, mashallah. It was after Fajr prayer. I gave a small reminder. And uh, I said, radiallahu an, for someone who wasn't a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So somebody yelled at me for it. And uh, Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah, is my sanad in this issue. So Imam al-Nawawi, he said that it is mustahab, yustahabu al-taraddi wa tarahum ala al-ulama'i wa salihin This is the meaning of it, which is that it's praiseworthy to say radiallahu an and rahimahullah for not only the sahaba. so people generally think radiallahu an is only for the sahaba and rahimahullah is for anything afterwards and it could go either way that's conventionally used but in general it's praiseworthy to make dua <laughs> and that's essentially what that is is to make dua for people who are righteous that have come before us so imam abu hanifa radiallahu an is referred to as an Imam al azam the greatest of the four Imams. Um, for some of us, that's probably a means that inspires some level of groupism inside of us. <laughs> He's an Imam al azam He's our Imam. We're Hanafis. You know? Alhamdulillah, we are. <laughs> and it's an honor to be attributed to the Imam al azam But uh, the other Imams are great as well, as we will notice, inshallah. So the reason why we're talking about this is because there's a number of reasons. One of them is because we always need role models. And the four Imams are role models that have been agreed upon throughout the centuries. So it's good to learn a little bit more about their lives. The second reason is that <coughs> uh, we often refer to the four Imams. You know, people will say, this school says this, this school says that, and the schools are being named after their imams. And so it's good to know the history of these people and, and how elevated their status actually was. And, uh, and just to know a little bit about them. So, uh, so this is, these are some of the reasons. It's important also to know from the outset that there were many more than four imams. So in the time of Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed, there were many, many other imams. There was Al Layth ibn Sa'ad, there was Sufyan al Thawri, there was Imam al Awza'i, there was uh, Al Tabari, was Akhir al Mujtahideen, they say. Um, a number of people. A number of people. So, why do we have these four? And essentially, we have these four because the entire body of the teachings of these four has been preserved and refined along with their methodologies over the course of centuries. This is the difference. So we might have, you might read in a book of tafsir, for example, and see that the opinion of Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad was such and such on any given issue. And Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad was a contemporary of Imam al-Shafi'i, and he lived in Egypt, and they say, كان al-Layth أَفْقَهُ مِنَ shafii That he was actually, his fiqh was stronger than his shafii But what is the difference between the two, they said? But Al-Layth, his students didn't serve his work. In the end, if your students don't write down your work, your work gets lost, right? At least on a written level. Imam Abu Hanifa, we have his school largely because Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah, one of the top two students of Imam Abu Hanifa who took the painstaking effort to document all of his opinions on a number of issues, right? So then we have this body of information. And Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad didn't have that. 
But yet he was a great faqih. He was a great imam. So you might have an opinion attributed to him in a book of tafsir. You might have an opinion attributed to him in a commentary on hadith or any number of different places. The problem is that, number one, you don't have the other body of his opinions. So you don't have the context to that particular issue in relation to his other thought. And you don't also have not only the context, but you don't also know if he changed that opinion. Because you don't have the entire body, right? The other thing is you don't have his methodology. So the difference with the four imams is that you have all of their opinions and you have their methodology and you have a refinement of the application of their methodology over the centuries and a preservation of it. Right? So this is what really makes them uh, especially unique uh, outside of just the practice of the Muslims over the centuries. So for Imam Abu Hanifa, I, I don't want to take too long because it's Friday night and people are probably tired and stuff. But Imam Abu Hanifa, we're going to do just a short biography and then talk a little bit about his character and his qualities. So he was chronologically the first of the four Imams, although him and Imam Malik were contemporaries, similar time periods. And Imam Malik died a little bit after him. It's important to recognize from the outset that all of the four Imams are interconnected somehow. And this is the way that the See, the, the scholarly community of Islam has always been international. It's an interesting thing. It's always been an international scholarly community. Because people who are dedicated to learning, they travel in order to learn from the top most, foremost people of their time. So you have people traveling all over the place. And it's known, these are the top people in this place, these are the top people in this place. So when you go, you can kind of navigate those areas. And... And so these students all dealt with each other somehow, some way. And the scholarly community is always tied together somehow. You know, even in the world today, there's what, six degrees of separation between any person, right? So if you're in the scholarly community, usually there's one degree separation, two degrees max. And people know, because they know, like this person studied with this person who studied with this person who studied from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they know exactly how the trees are playing out, you know. So Abu Hanifa was the first. Imam Malik was his contemporary. Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, the top student of Imam Abu Han or one of the top students of Imam Abu Hanifa, also studied with Malik. He has actually a narration of the Muwatta. The Muwatta is the collection of hadith and opinions and sayings of the Sahaba and so on that Imam Malik collected. Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani has a narration of that text from Imam Malik. So it shows how close he was with him. And then he came to Abu Hanifa. So there's an overlap here. Uh, Abu Hanifa and Malik met in their lifetimes. There's narrations of debates that occurred between them. <laughs> you know, that they went into the house and people weren't there. And then Malik came out and he was wiping his forehead. Like, man, that was a tough conversation. <laughs> you know, they were really going at it. Uh, not in a bad way, but they were really, you know, dealing with these issues. Uh, Imam al-Shafi'i was a student of Imam Malik as well. And Imam al-Shafi'i was a contemporary and learned also from Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. So you see how they're all interacting with each other. And uh, Imam Ahmed was a student of Imam al-Shafi'i. So all of them are tied together in different ways one or two spaces removed. So Abu Hanifa is the first one. He, he was born in 80 after Hijra. 80 after Hijra. Uh, there is some debate, but it's pretty you know commonly assumed that he was a tabi'i and that he had met some of the Sahaba who lived to be very old. So some of the Sahaba who lived to be very old, he met them in his younger age. So he's considered from the tabi'in. Although more properly speaking, like he comes to age in the time of the tabi'in, tabi the generation after the tabi'in. But technically, you could argue that he's a tabi'in. Imam Abu Hanifa, is, his grandfather was from Kabul. From Kabul in modern day Afghanistan. And uh, his name is actually an numan ibn Thabit. an numan ibn Thabit. So his name was actually Nu'man. Uh, and he was the founder of a school that was very great. And we also know other Nu'mans who were founders of great schools. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them and their families and increase them, inshallah. Ameen. 
So Nu'man ibn Thabit is Abu Hanifa. They say Abu Hanifa was the consequence of a dua of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. The Ali ibn Abi Talib met the grandfather of Abu Hanifa and uh, Abu Hanifa's grandfather gave him this uh, gift basically, like a type of food. And when he gave it to him, he prayed for his progeny. And then out of his progeny came Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. And he died again in 150. So he lived to be about 70 years old. There is some debate in the books, especially because Abu Hanifa is a very controversial figure for some. So you'll find people who praise him immensely, and you'll find people who want to detract from him. So you'll see sometimes complete nonsense things. In old books, you know, they'll say like, Abu Hanifa only knew 40 hadith. <laughs> or, you know, it's just complete nonsense. I don't think probably like servants in the time that Abu Hanifa lived in probably knew more than 40 hadith with their chain of narration. Because it was just the world that they were living in, right? So some, there's a debate about whether or not Abu Hanifa's ancestors were slaves. And uh, and Mekki, one of the biographers, he says something that I think is important. It ends the whole thing. He says, I'lam taqwa a'la al-ansab wa aqwa asbab al-thawab. So he says, what is this? In the end of the day, taqwa is the highest lineage that you can have. And it's the best reason to gain you reward from Allah. So who cares? <laughs> if his grandparents were originally slaves or not or any of this, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that Abu Hanifa had taqwa. That he served Allah and he served deen. And he, by, by doing so, he was elevated to a very high level. In his time, many, many scholars were not Arab. Many, many of the greatest scholars in his time, that early on, were not Arabs. Uh, and I... I this should inspire us, but it should also, we should keep something in mind. Um, saying that they're not, because sometimes again people will detract from Abu Hanifa, they'll say, well he wasn't an Arab. He was of Persian origin, right? So how can we trust him? That's like saying that, that's like saying that, who should I use? That's like saying that my wife is not an American, so even though, she, I mean technically... Just roll with it. It's like saying that she's not an American, so we can't trust her English. Okay, but she was born in an English-speaking environment. She went to school in English. She studied in English. Everything she did was in English. Her parents spoke a different language. Okay. That doesn't mean she doesn't understand English, right? So Abu Hanifa is not an Arab, but he grew up in an Arab intellectual milieu. Like his, his intellectual world was an Arab-speaking intellectual world. So he's not. it's not like he was a... He was a native speaker, <laughs> put it that way, right? He, it, he understood Arabic as, as a native language. It wasn't something that he had to, um, you know, that was broken or something like that. So, but many scholars in his time were not Arab. So there's a story of Ibn Abi Layla, who was one of the scholars of that time, with Isa ibn Musa. So Isa ibn Musa was one of the rulers. And he comes to Ibn Abi Layla and he tells him, who are the greatest scholars in this place? And he names two people. And he says, are they Arabs or non-Arabs? He says, non-Arabs. He says, what about this place? Names another place. He said these two. He said, are they Arabs or non-Arabs? He said, they're non-Arabs. He went through eight cities, eight of the major cities of Islam in that period. All of them were non-Arabs. So finally, he got to the next one, and Ibn Abi Layla's like, he's getting really angry. You know, because this guy, he's asking because he's kind of like nationalistic. You know, he wants, he wants some Arab scholars. So finally, he got to the ninth city. He was like, okay, I'll give him like this one, because this guy... He gives these two. So are they Arabs or non-Arabs? He said, one of them's Arab, one of them's not Arab. You know, he gave him one. But the point is, in that time, so many of the great scholars were not Arabs. Uh, even the, the compilers of the six books of Hadith. Right? Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah. None of them are Arabs. They're all not Arabs. So the scholarly community of that time was not... Uh, Ethnically divided you could say like in, in the sense that you if you want to study you study and he was born and raised in Kufa and Kufa in Iraq and Kufa was an extremely diverse and crazy city at that time I mean intellectually just all kinds of things were going on there you had Sunnis and you had Shia and you had different other fringe groups and you had non-Muslims and you, I mean at this time in Kufa in Iraq the Muslims are not the majority 80 to 150, 80 to 150, the Muslims are probably 
uh, in the range of like 15 to 20 percent of the population, just to, you know, to put things into perspective. It wasn't until several centuries later that Muslims became the majority. So 80 after Hijra, 100 after Hijra, 150 after Hijra, we're in the range of like 30% by the time he dies. Uh, so it's a very insane city. And so one time he went to Ata ibn Abi Rabah, who was a great scholar in the Hijaz at that time uh, in Arabia. And when Ata saw him, he asked him, where did you come from? He said, Kufa. So he immediately asked him, like, okay, so like, what's the deal with you? Which camp do you belong to? And Abu Hanifa gave this beautiful answer that basically explained that he's not from this fringe group and he's not from this fringe group and he's not from this fringe group. He's from the mainstay of the Muslims. And that's who in Ata was like, okay, alhamdulillah. But the point is that just him coming from Kufa raised the question mark. <laughs> you know, you came from there, okay, which side are you on? Because that place is just a free-for-all of intellectual activity. So this is what he grew up in. And he didn't actually grow up as a student of knowledge. Uh, again, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't misunderstand that. He grew up in an in, in a, in a early Islamic city that had a lot of knowledge. So it's very likely that he had already memorized the Qur'an. It's very likely that he had a good solid grounding in Arabic. He probably knew a lot of poetry. He probably knew more than the shiyukh know today. But he wasn't a proper student early on in his life. Uh, and it wasn't until the age of 22 that a very important incident happened. And this incident, really, when I think about it, it blows my mind. It really blows my mind. Because basically what happened was he was walking. He was going to and from the marketplace. His father was a businessman. And he would go to the marketplace and so on. So he's going to the marketplace and a man stops him. And this man happens to be Imam al-Sha'bi. Imam al-Sha'bi was one of the great scholars of Kufa at that time. And he tells him, إِلَى مَنْ Which means, in, in modern Arabic, people probably don't even understand what this means. But إِلَى مَنْ means, who do you go to? It means, who do you go to? Like, from the people of knowledge, who do you go to? He's like, I don't go to anyone. <laughs> he said, I don't, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not a student, right? And he told him, you should go to people. You should go to the people of knowledge. And then he told him, Inni arafika yaqada wa haraka. He said, I see in you an, a, a level of enlightenment. And you, like there's an awakeness to you. And uh, uh, like a motivation to you. Like you're active. You know, you, 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 you like to be involved in things. You're, you're, you're moving and you're awake and you're paying attention, he's like, you should go to the people of knowledge. Like, look, look at this incident. This is what got Abu Hanifa to go down the path of learning. This one conversation. Shabi sitting in the marketplace. First of all, he's a great scholar. He's sitting in the marketplace. right? Because he's probably looking to do what he just did with Abu Hanifa. And he tells Abu Hanifa, you know, you have something special about you. Don't waste it. Essentially what he's telling him is, you have something special about you, don't waste it. You should go and do something serious. You should go to the people of knowledge. So that's how Abu Hanifa starts. At the age of 22, he starts. He goes to his teacher Hamad. He stays with Hamad until he's 40 years old, which is when Hamad died. So how many years did he stay with Hamad? He stayed with him 18 years. After 10 years of being with him, he had the thought to himself that maybe he should you know, start his own circle. The other thing that fascinates me about this is that how informal stuff is. You know, like literally one of the narrations says, Abu Hanifa went into the masjid and he thought to himself, maybe I should have my own circle. So instead of going and sit with Hamad, he went and sat over here. Or he went to go sit over there and he thought to himself, it's not appropriate for me to sit by myself when my teacher is over there and start my own circle. So he picks up his sandals and he goes and he sits with Hamad. So like imagine <laughs> you have the greatest scholars in the world being trained in like this corner of the masjid. And someone comes into that halaqah for 10 years and they're like, you know what, maybe I should just go sit on that side of the masjid. And then they go to sit on that side of the masjid and think to themselves, yeah, you know what, that's not appropriate. I'm going to go back to my sheikh. It was... It, in the same masjid, <laughs> you know, the circle is there, the circle is there. So the intellectual activity of the time was just unbelievable. And Imam Abu Hanifa continued in his field of, of being a businessman. He continued in his field, although he was studying full time. But he managed to, you know, be involved in business, but not consumed by business. And he was very, uh, he was called, he was nicknamed Abu Bakr. 
because he was very uh, strict about how he dealt with money. And there's different stories that happen. Like for example, one time a woman came and uh, or Imam Abu Hanifa went to buy a garment from a woman. And he asked her, how much is it? She said, it cost, it's a hundred. And he said, it's worth more than that. <laughs> he said, it's worth more than that. She said, two hundred. He said, it's worth more than that. She said, three hundred. He said, it's worth more than that. She said, why are you making fun of me? He said, it's worth more than that. She said, five hundred. He's like, it's worth five hundred. Here's five hundred. So he wouldn't, you know, this woman doesn't know the value of what she's selling. But he knows. He wants to pay what the value is. Another time an old woman came to him. And she told him, sell me this garment for what you got it for. You know. So he said, you can have it for four dirhams. And she said the same thing. Don't make fun of me. Like, why are you saying that? You know. And he said, you can have it for four dirhams. She said, why? He said, because I bought two garments and they were combined 200 dirhams. Right? Around like, the numbers on this side. Basically, he bought two garments. He sold one of them for the price of the two except for four. So when she tells him, sell it to me for what you bought it for, he bought those two first. There's only four left. So he tells her, you could have it for four. So she got like this crazy deal on it, right? <laughs> He's not going to make any more. That's just the way that he is. And he would spend his money actually to support the scholars even. As well as his own students. Abu Yusuf, his, his top student. We mentioned Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. Abu Yusuf was his top student. Abu Yusuf after Abu Hanifa was Qadi al Quda. He was the first Qadi al Quda. He was the first supreme judge you know, of the Muslim empire. And... Early on in his studies, he's coming to the circle of Abu Hanifa. And Abu Hanifa likes him, he's a good student, everything else, and he just stops showing up. I mean, like, just so far, and we've been talking for 15 minutes, look how many incidents that are so small, it completely changed the course of history. <laughs> you know, that little conversation between Imam al-Shabi, Abu Hanifa, changed the course of history. This incident right here changed the course of history. He's Qadi and Quda. You know, he wrote books that people didn't write before him. And Kharaj, for example, dealing with like taxation of lands and, and criminal justice and things like that. He wrote Abu Yusuf, things that weren't there. Abu Yusuf stopped showing up to class. Abu Hanifa went to look for him. He went to his home. He asked his family, like, what's going on? Where did where'd he go? Yaqub. Where did Yaqub go? They said that, you know, we don't have a whole lot of money. And he needs to work, you know, for the family. He has to work for the family. We don't have any choice. So Abu Hanifa told him, if I pay him to come study with me, will you let him come study? They said yes. So from that time on, Abu, Hanif Abu Yusuf is on Abu, Abu Hanifa is paying him to study with him. <laughs> Imagine like the, the irony of the whole thing, right? Like he's paying him to study with him. I wish, yeah Allah, I wish we could do this kind of stuff. Like, I wish I had the money that Abu Hanifa has. I could pay people to study, not with me, but with other people who they should be studying with. You know? But like, imagine the, the concept, subhanAllah. He's paying him to study with him, and not for a few years. Abu Yusuf stayed with Abu Hanifa for about 20 years. Before, you know, and then that circumstance passed, right? So he supported the scholars, he supported his own students. Uh, he would encourage, he dressed very beautifully and he would encourage his students to dress beautifully as well. So one time there's a story that one of his students used to come like very raggedy. And so one day at the class he told the guy to stay afterwards. And he stayed afterwards and he had snuck money like under the guy's book or rug or something, you know. And so Abu Hanifa tells him, lift up your, your thing. And he finds the money there. And he says, oh, I don't need money. He says, if you don't need money, like why are you dressed like this? You shouldn't be so raggedy. You dress a little bit nicer, and, and then you can, you know. But if you need the money, take care of yourself. If you need to take it, take it, you know. So he used to do that. He used to also pay other scholars in his time. Like they say that Imam Abu Hanifa used to have a list, a roster of all of these scholars in his time, and he would give them stipends. And he would tell them, I don't want anything out of this. You know, I don't want anything in return. I don't want just, it's between me and you, just take the money type thing. And so he was very, very generous. He also lived in very politically turbulent times. 
very politically turbulent time. So he initially was under the Umayyads for 52 years of his life. And then for 18 years of his life, he was under the Abbasids. He indirectly or directly supported revolutions against both of them. He did. Yeah, it's very. It's one of those things. I don't have a good answer on it yet. But he didn't always get along uh, with the people who uh, were ruling over him. And as a consequence, he was he was uh, in, imprisoned. He was beaten. He he faced a lot of hardship as a result of it. It wasn't just like you know, I don't like you. I posted on Facebook. But he was. He actually faced hardship as a result of it. You know. Um, but he maintained his independence. And they say one time he was beaten very badly. And he didn't cry. He was okay with it, whatever. Uh, and the only time he really started to cry was when his mother saw him and she cried. So he felt bad for how she felt, you know. But it wasn't about him. He was facing what he was facing for the sake of Allah and he dealt with it. And you'll see many circumstances where he was very uh, pious and upright. So for example, one of them, one of the Khalifas, Al-Mansur, he has a lot of incidents with Al-Mansur. <laughs> it's interesting. Al-Mansur called him and um, the, he had a problem with his wife. So they wanted Abu Hanifa to intervene between him and his wife. So they call Abu Hanifa and Al-Mansur says to Abu Hanifa, he's the Khalifa. He says, Abu Hanifa, this free woman contends with me. Give me my right against her. So now Abu Hanifa is the judge, right? Abu Hanifa said, let Amir al-Mu'mineen speak. Go ahead. Abu Hanifa, he replied, how many wives can a man marry at the same time? Four, he replied. How many slave girls is he allowed? As many as he likes, was the reply. This is the time they lived in. Is anyone permitted to say anything different? No, replied the imam. You have heard, said the Khalifa to his wife. <laughs> okay. But Abu Hanifa continued. Allah has allowed this to the people of fairness. If, however, anyone is not fair or fears that he will not be fair, he should have only one. Allah Almighty says, but if you are afraid of not treating them equally, then only one. So we must follow the discipline of Allah and take heed of his admonitions. So he, he didn't you know, back down from the situation. He told him what it was. He says, Al-Mansur was silent for a long time. Then Abu Hanifa got up and left. When he got to his home, there was a servant sent from the caliph's wife with all kinds of gifts and money and different things, right? <laughs> because he kind of like helped her. right? So she sent him all these gifts and stuff. And he told the servant who brought everything, he told him, give her my greeting and tell her that she's a fitna for my deen. She's sending me all of these things. Tell her that this, she's endangering my deen and take all of this back. I did it for Allah. I don't desire anything else send all of the all of the money back right in other cases Abu Hanifa he was very brilliant very very brilliant person subhanallah uh, and very powerful and Mansur also one time there was when the revolutions were going on and stuff there was a, a general of his who wanted to go uh, who realized that he wasn't doing what was right and he didn't want to go and fight the Muslims over this issue that was going on so he asked Abu Hanifa what he should do and if he can be forgiven and so on. He said, if you're sincere, then Allah will re uh, accept your repentance. But if you're called to fight again, you, ha you can't do it. Okay? So he was sent to go fight. And uh, he decided that he said, I will not go against this man. I mean, Muhammad and nafs al Zakiya. So he said, I'm not going against him. So the this is the interesting question to me. And Mansur was angry. The caliph was angry, Al-Mansur. He says, we have suspected his mind for a year. He seems muddled. I will go, I am more entitled. So this is someone else who was with him. And now he says, I'll go and I'll lead the soldiers, you know. Al-Mansur says the following. He said, which faqir does he go to? That's what's interesting to me. Look at the, the social intellectual situation of the time. Right, this is the general of the army. He's supposed to lead people into a battle and the caliph is telling him to go. He says, no, I'm not going to go. The caliph turns to his confidant and he asks him, who does he go to? Who's his faqih? Who's his shaykh? They tell him he goes to Abu Hanifa. <laughs> Abu Hanifa is the one that told him, like, you can't do this, right? And so this is, he, he had issues uh, with the governments that he faced at that time and also from some of the people that were around the governors that he faced at that time. 
And so some of these, for example, um, are, are very beautiful, very beautiful and very sharp stories. So there's a story that Al-Mansur summoned Abu Hanifa and Al-Rabi'a, the chamberlain of Al-Mansur, who was hostile to Abu Hanifa. Okay, so Al-Mansur is the Khalifa. He summons Abu Hanifa. And the, the, the advisor of the Khalifa is Rabi'a. He doesn't like Abu Hanifa. Okay, Rabi'a doesn't like Abu Hanifa. So Rabi'a says, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Abu Hanifa contradicts your grandfather Abdullah ibn Abbas. Right? So, I mean, like, he's throwing them in the fire right now. He says, Abu Hanifa contradicts your grandfather Abdullah ibn Abbas. He stated that when someone swore an oath and then made an exception a day or two later, the exception was permitted. But Abu Hanifa says that the exception is not allowed unless it is simultaneous with the oath. Okay, so do you understand this situation? Situation is someone makes an oath. If they're going to put an exception on the oath, it has to be in the sitting. This is Abu Hanifa's opinion. And they're saying Abdullah bin Abbas, his opinion was that it can be later. So Abu Hanifa's opinion is different than Abdullah bin Abbas's opinion. And the Khalifa is a descendant of, he's an Abbasid. He's a descendant of Ibn Abbas and Abbas. So he's trying to set him up. Okay. Abu Hanifa said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Rabi'a claims that you have no allegiance from your army. He doesn't answer it directly, right? He goes, okay, you want to play this game? Amir al-Mu'mineen, this guy says that you have no allegiance from your army. He said, how is that? He said, they swear to you and then return to their homes and they make an exception. And so their oaths are invalid, right? If you can make an exception to the oath after the gathering then your army can swear you an oath and go home and accept the oath, right? <laughs> Make an exception to the oath. So, uh, so when he said that, and Mansur started laughing, and he told Rabia, he said, don't mess with Abu Hanifa. <laughs> you don't know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> don't mess with him, right? So then Abu Rabia said, when they left, Rabia said to Abu Hanifa, he said, you wanted to spill my blood. Look at the answer too, subhanAllah, because this is very serious stuff, right? He said, you wanted to spill my blood. You know what Abu Hanifa's response was? He says, you wanted to spill mine. And I saved you and me. This is You wanted to spill mine and I saved you and me. I got us both out of it. Not just me, I got us both out of it. So like, you should thank me basically. Another time, there was another uh, advisor of, uh, or person that used to be in the gatherings of the, of the Khalifa. And he also didn't like Abu Hanifa. Okay, so he said to himself, he said, today I'm going to finish with Abu Hanifa. And uh, he went to Abu Hanifa, he said, Abu Hanifa, the Amir al-Mu'mineen commands one of us to strike off the head of another man without knowing who it is. Is it permitted to do that? So, you know, these people are serving the ruler. He says, Abu Hanifa, the ruler tells us we have to take someone's head off. We don't know this person. Is it permissible for us to do it? Okay, everyone understands the question? So obviously he's kind of trying to set him up, right? So he says, Abu Hanifa replied, Does the Amir al-Mu'mineen command what is right or does he command falsehood? <laughs> Again, like a little different response. Does he command right or does he command falsehood? He says he commands what is right. So Abu Hanifa said, carry out the right wherever it is and you will not be questioned about it. Right? Carry out the right wherever it is, you won't be questioned about it. So if he commands right, then why are you asking? There's nothing to ask about if you believe that he commands right. But if you believe that he commands wrong, then you can take that up with him. It's not my business. Right? So he, Abu Hanifa got up after that and he said to the people who were close to him, he said, this guy wanted to tie me up and I tied him up. <laughs> I tied him up. I, got, I, I dealt with the situation. So Abu Hanifa was very, very sharp. Very sharp person. And you know he was also very patient. You know, sometimes people would say, ask him questions, they would differ with him, and they would curse him, they would yell at him, they would say different things. One of the things that he said was, Allahumma man daqa bina sadru fa inna qulubana qad tasa'atna. He says, whoever, O oh Allah, those whose chests have constricted in relation to us, then our hearts are wide for them. 
O oh Allah, if their chests are constricted for us, our hearts are wide for them. So even when people feel bad about him, they don't like him and this and that, says we still love them, still have space in our heart to love him. So he was uh, very beautiful uh, in this regard. And he was imprisoned, he was beaten, and eventually he died. There's different narrations as a result of that, uh, that imprisonment. I'll say just a little bit about his characteristics and then we'll stop, uh, about his personality. So one of the things about his personality is that he had great discipline and self-control. I already told one of the examples was that people would curse him, they would say different things to them, and he would say, Allahumma man daqa bihi sadrun, uh, man daqa bina sadru fa inna qulubina qadata sa'at la. So, you know, we, we have patience with the people. Another thing was that one time it said that like a snake crawled onto him while he was teaching his class and he didn't flinch. There's stories of Imam Malik like this as well. That they'd be teaching and they'd be being harmed by like a snake or something else and they wouldn't stop until they finished. Like say for example they started a hadith, they finished the hadith before they stopped. I'm not going to stop in the middle of the narration. Um, and there were also times uh, when people would curse him and then he would ask them for forgiveness and things and part of it was not because of himself this is something that I kind of referenced it a little bit in the khutbah we don't always understand these concepts but someone may have a very high station with Allah okay so when someone else curses them it's not about them being cursed by the person why, why they seek forgiveness from the person it's not actually for themselves they seek forgiveness for the person because they don't want the person to have that in their heart against them. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So you have someone like Abu Hanifa, who's righteous, who's good, who's knowledgeable, who's pious, who prays, who fasts, who gives charity, who serves Islam, who struggles in the way of Allah, all of these things, right? Someone comes to him and curses him. Who are you worried for? You're not worried for Abu Hanifa. You're worried for the person who did that. Because the person is causing harm to someone who's beloved to Allah. So you go to that person, ask them for their forgiveness, try to make amends with it, because it's better for that person. Right? So sometimes it's important to think about this too. Like it's better for everyone. When we squash things that happen, it's better, than, it's better for everyone. It's better for the offender, it's better for the offended, it's better for everyone involved to try to not have these things in our hearts. He said, فَإِنَّ غِيبَةَ الْعُلَمَاءَ تَبْقَى شَيْئًا بَعْدَهُمْ he said, but the one thing that he was very strict on is that you don't speak ill of scholars. So you don't speak ill of scholars. This is when he would get really angry. He said, because when you speak ill of scholars, you make ghibah of scholars, it remains after them. Its effect remains after them. SubhanAllah, look at the wisdom of it. Like you might have someone who has so much knowledge, they're so beneficial to the ummah, but because people keep talking, you know, be careful of so and so, be careful of so and so. Actually, you know what? These people, they're not sincere. Actually, they're just doing it for money. This and this and this and this and this. We have to be very careful of these things. You know, I posted it online. There was a conversation today. You know, sometimes people say imams, they leave their positions and stuff like that because they can make a lot of money when they travel and so on. First of all, you don't know if that's true. You don't know why someone might need money. Maybe they're in debt. Maybe they have aging parents. Maybe whatever it might be, right? But most of the time, it's just not true. So, like, after I resigned from my position, one time someone came up to me. And they're like, now that you're so famous, mashallah, and traveling all over the place and stuff, why don't you donate to our cause? And I was like, I'll donate to my rent. <laughs> like I don't know how much money you think I'm making I'm not I'm certainly not making enough to be like donating to every cause on the face of the earth but sometimes we just assume things of people and then this illness that we have in our hearts it starts affecting a lot of things so we might have an interpretation of something like we assume something about someone and then we go talk about it and then it stays like the honor of that person has been affected beyond what you said and it, and it goes afterwards and with the scholars it's especially dangerous so Abu Hanifa this is where he used to draw his line he said if you speak ill of the people of knowledge and piety it stays after them and it's, it happened to him right? I mean it happened to him Imam uh, I found out recently it wasn't Imam al Nawawi. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad who was it Imam al quotes this quote, and I can't recall who said it right now. 
But he said, Inna nahum al ulama'i masmuma wa hatkun wa wa sunnat Allah fi hatki astari muntaqisihim ma'luma. فمن أطلق لسانه في العلماء بالثلب ابتلاه الله قبل موته بموت القلب. He said that the the flesh of the people of knowledge is poisonous, and the one who uh, lets their tongue go loosely in these issues, then uh, Allah will test them before their death with the death of their heart. So we have to be careful the way we talk about people. May Allah protect us. Imam Abu Hanifa was also an independent thinker. He was an independent thinker. So many people, for example, in the later time of his uh, life, they didn't pray for Uthman ibn Affan, uh, They wouldn't say, Rahimahullah, radiallahu anhu, and all this stuff, because it was a time of fitna. The Umayyads had left, the Abbasids were in charge now. But Abu Hanifa, he would continue to do it. Because this is, what he, this is what's right. He's independent, regardless of the consequences and so on. He was also a very deep thinker. So very deep and analytical in the way that he would analyze things. There's, there's cases where it said that in his, in his study circle, which was basically like a think tank, he had specialists in all different areas of Islamic studies and they would come together and they would have conversations. And it said that he was so talented in like legal analysis that they would raise a question and he would ask them like, what do you guys think? And they would answer. And he said, well, what about such and such? And they say, okay, yeah, maybe that's the right way to look at it. And then, he would, then he would change it again. He'd be like, well, what about such and such? And so, well, maybe that's... And no matter which way he went, people are like, wow, maybe that's... That we should consider that. <laughs> you know, because he, his, his mind was just that, that strong. And he was very clever and very quick in his intelligence. So one of the stories is about Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, that show how clever he was. And, and how caring he was also for people. Because he doesn't have to do these things. He's an imam al-a'zam. Right? But there was an, a man in his time who believed that Uthman ibn Affan was a Jew. Radiallahu anhu. And he wouldn't give up this belief. Nobody, anyone who tried to convince him, whatever, this was his belief. So Abu Hanifa went to this man's house and he told him, I have someone who wants to marry your daughter. He said, okay, tell me about him. He said, mashallah, you know, he's very well off, memorized the Quran, pious person, good family. He starts naming all the good qualities a person can have, right? So he tells him, you know, Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, people would settle for much less than this. You know, this is, it sounds like a great guy. He said, you know, but there's one drawback. He said, what's the drawback? He said, the drawback is he's a Jew. So the guy got really upset. He's like, you want me to marry my daughter to a Jew and all these kind of things, right? He said, you're telling me you're better than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who married his daughter to a Jew. Right? One of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ was married to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anh. Then she passed away. Then he married a second daughter to him. So he said, look at how he comes to the... Comes to the he says, are you telling me you're better than the Prophet ﷺ? You wouldn't marry your daughter to a Jew? The guy's like, okay, I give up. Uthman ibn Affan wasn't a Jew. You're right. <laughs> you know, so, so he went in this angle. He was very clever and very caring. Uh, he was also sincere in seeking the truth. You see it from all of the four imams. They were great, and they were brilliant, and they were beyond peer in many things. And yet they were always sincere, and always humble. So Imam Abu Hanifa used to say, He said, this opinion that we state, it's just our opinion. And it's the best that we've been able to come to. So if someone comes to us with something that's better than it, then they're more, they're, they have more right to being correct than we do. Like this is, I, this is the opinion that I came to, but maybe I'm wrong. It's the best I did, but maybe someone will come with better. And this is again, you know, someone who has that much humility, even though they're in the position that they're in. One time someone came to him, they said, Like on some issue, you know, and they gave him the answer. He says, is this the truth? That's, without any doubt, this is the truth. Abu Hanifa said, Wallahi la adri. La alluhu al-batul alladhi la shakka fi. He said, I don't know. Maybe it's the falsehood that there's no doubt in it. Like, this is the best I can do. It could be wrong. So if you're asking me, is it the absolute truth? No doubt. I don't know. I can't tell you. Because of some of these issues, you can't tell. If they're a difference of opinion, like, you don't know. One of them could be right. One of them could be wrong. Maybe both of them are right. Maybe, you know, whatever it might be. So he didn't... Um, you know, he was very humble 
in that regard. Uh, the sixth is that he had a strong personality. Of course, he had a very strong personality. We saw all these stories, how he dealt with rulers, how he dealt with differences, how his charity that he gave, all of these things require strong personalities. Yet, he didn't force his opinion on others. How do you know? There's a great example of how Abu Hanifa didn't force his opinion on others, and it remains with us in every single page of Hanifi fiqh books up to today. How many, some of you are IOK students. How many of you guys have read Quduri? Anything from Mukhtasar and Quduri, right? What do you find when you read Mukhtasar and Quduri? Abu Hanifa said this, and As-Sahiban, they said this. The two Imams, they said this, and Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani said this. At Tarafan, they said this, Abu Hanifa and Muhammad said this, and Abu Yusuf said this. <laughs> SubhanAllah, it's in the books up to today. Those are his two closest students. So regardless of how much knowledge he had and how much and he supported them. Remember, Abu Yusuf supported by him for 20 years. He doesn't tell him, look, you have to adopt my opinion. You have to follow what I follow. And these are serious issues. Like what time does Asr start? <laughs> His two companions differed with him. <laughs> it's a big issue, right? And no. Still in the books up to today. This is his opinion, this is their opinion. Sometimes they agree, sometimes they disagree. Strong personality doesn't mean you bully someone. Right? And these are intellectual issues. Sometimes, you know, there's, a, there's some space there. So we'll stop here, inshallah. There's many things. The next sections are about his teachers and his students. Um, but, you know, khair. I think we got an idea, at least for his personality. And even if we get to Ramadan with an idea of the personality of the different imams, then that will be a good thing, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on us and to forgive us. And to accept from us our deeds, we ask Allah to have mercy on all of our imams and scholars and leaders and pious people and in our family and our relatives and our parents and our ancestors and our forefathers. May Allah have mercy on all of them. May He give shifa to those who are ill and forgive those who have passed away from us and moved on from us. May He allow us to follow the example of the great people who have come before us and to be true in seeking Him in everything that we do. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslim kathira. Any questions or comments anyone wants to share uh, about the topic? Any of the shuyukh, you have anything to add on uh, Imam Abu Hanifa or things that are particularly you know, relevant to you or stuff that kind of stands out to you? They say that he was a silk trader that used to sell in silk and like clothes and things like fabric basically yeah. alhamdulillah well I appreciate you letting me off easy Allah accept from all of us it's good to see you always inshallah we look forward to seeing you next month assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh